Well, in the spirit of things happening randomly today, lights go off, music gets changed, the order of service gets changed, and Kim does things in the wrong direction. I think we should change the order of who's preaching today. <laughs> so I'm going to close my eyes and... Uh... Mark Yacht, I think you should preach today. We'll, we'll just have a different sermon for the day. Uh, okay. Well, it's Pentecost. Pentecost. What are the things that you think of when I say the word Pentecost? Probably two things that aren't entirely true. One is that it's a Christian-only celebration, and it's not. And the other is that it is the coming of the Holy Spirit, which it is not. So before we can talk about Pentecost at all, let, let's try and do just a little bit of context setting in order to help us understand what today is about. The Feast of Pentecost actually began something like 1,500 years before the time of Jesus. This was not a solely Christian thing. It was a feast in the Jewish calendar. Originally, it was an agricultural festival. It was the beginning of the first harvest. And so people would come from far and wide and would come and bring before God the first fruits of the harvest to acknowledge our utter and total dependence on God for all that we do. Over the course of time, the meaning of the Pentecost for the Jewish people actually changed in that there was a group of rabbis who did some scholarly study and looked at when the people of Israel left Egypt and when the Ten Commandments were given on Mount Sinai. And they said that it actually occurred in their calculations that the... Um, the giving of the Ten Commandments was on Pentecost. It, it was, a, it was 40, not 50 days from Passover, a Sabbath of Sabbaths, 49, 7 times 7, 49 days, or on the 50th day, they celebrated Pentecost, and that was the giving of the law, and that was, to some, the birth of the Jewish nation. Did you know that? Pentecost is not only the birth of the Christian church, it's the birth of the Jewish nation on Pentecost. So we have this long history that's going on where God is able to take in Christian tradition something that's been going on for centuries and bring a whole new meaning, a whole new awareness of Pentecost. We think of Pentecost as the coming of the Holy Spirit. Is that when the Holy Spirit arrived? The Holy Spirit hadn't been active up until then? No. Just read through the book of the Acts of the Apostles and find out how many times just in that one book the Holy Spirit is mentioned. In Acts chapter 1, Luke says, And, and David, speaking by the Holy Spirit, said, and in Acts uh, 28, the, the author says, and Isaiah, speaking in the Spirit, said, and in Acts, oh, I've got to look that one up, I can't remember, Acts 16, nope, uh, Acts 7, Stephen is talking about how the Jewish leaders at the time in the Old Testament times were disobeying the Spirit. The Spirit was there Long before, the Spirit had been working right from the beginning of creation. Father, Son, and Spirit, eternal God, from the beginning of time until then. But there was something that was new at Christian Pentecost, and that was the arrival of the Spirit in a brand new fashion. At Christmas... We celebrate Emmanuel, God with us. At Pentecost, we celebrate God in us. That the Holy Spirit came in a way to revive, to renew, and to refresh 
all the believers of that day and throughout history. If you can imagine, if we had no Christian Pentecost, no infilling of the Holy Spirit, what the Christian church would have been like. It would have been that we would have had Jesus' life, death, resurrection, ascension, and then nothing. We would have had some wonderful memories of what Jesus did way back then, but there would be no power, no authority in what we do as believers today. It is in that that we find the true sense of Pentecost, God coming to be with us, not just in word, but to come right inside of us. Have you had that experience of knowing that the presence of God is not just somehow out there, but the presence of God is in here. And the presence of God is allowing us to do things that under our own human strength or power we would never be able to do. John, in his writing, talked about, I think the word in this version was the advocate, or in some other versions, it's the counselor. It actually is a word that is reminiscent of the Jewish word for a lawyer. One who comes and stands and speaks for you. You've never been to court, right? You, you've never had that experience of having to go before a judge and having somebody who will actually stand and advocate for you. And John says, that, that's what the Holy Spirit's like. The Holy Spirit comes and advocates for us, but actually in us and gives us words that we can speak ourselves, but we know that those words are not coming from inside us. They are coming from a holy God that is moving within us and gives us the words to speak at the right time, at the right place. When the Spirit comes, how does the Spirit influence us? Well, I think the Spirit influences us in a whole lot of ways. One way is, I think the Spirit changes how we think. We have all in our Christian journey, at times I am sure, had all kinds of questions and doubts, things that we don't understand, and somehow when the Spirit comes, we may not understand all mysteries, but how we think about God will change. The Holy Spirit will change our will. What we decide to do in life Chances are, each of us have at times made decisions that later on we might regret and say, oh shoot, I, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I had more strength, more power to be able to turn away from temptation, to be able to do what's right. And the Holy Spirit, when the Spirit comes in power, is able to affect our will and to make us be able to choose wisely and to choose rightly. The Holy Spirit will be able to change our emotions, how we feel, how we feel about ourselves, how we feel about others, how we feel about God. The Holy Spirit working in us goes so deep inside that even how we feel can be changed. The Holy Spirit can also change our bodies, and how we act. The Holy Spirit can bring healing to those who are sick. The Holy Spirit can make people do things that they wouldn't ordinarily do, sometimes give a boldness that they have never had before, and to be able to do things that are outside their comfort zone because of the power of the Holy Spirit that is at work within us. Well, also in John's Gospel, the writer says that Jesus said to his disciples, receive the Holy Spirit. That is an active verb, receive. 
It's not something that God just automatically pours on us and there's nothing on our part. No, instead Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit, which means a willingness, a willingness on our part to be able to receive the gift that God has for us already. Well, how do we receive the Holy Spirit? I have a fascination with self-help books. And so I, I was in the local bookstore the other day and right between how to fix your own toilet and windows for dummies was a book called How to Receive the Holy Spirit on Your Own. And I thought, what a great idea. So I had to buy this book. And I brought it home. It, it was very comprehensive. Chapter one, how to lay on hands. There is the right-handed method and there is the left-handed method. It tells us where to lay on hands and where not to lay on hands. Well, the, the second chapter of the book after how to lay on hands was prayers of invocation of the Holy Spirit. There were prayers in Latin. There were prayers in Hebrew. There were prayers in Greek. There were prayers in Mandarin and there were prayers in English on how to invoke the Holy Spirit to be able to come upon us. Uh, chapter three was safety features as you are sitting at home in your living room praying for the Holy Spirit. Now it recognized you may not have a catcher so that if you go down you don't want to hurt yourself. So it said make sure you stand in a place in the room where there is no sharp objects around you anywhere in case you go down. And that if you have neighbors or windows open, it might be wise to tell your friends and neighbors, I'm going to pray for an increase in the Holy Spirit this afternoon, so don't worry. If things start happening, it's okay. I know what I'm doing. And if I don't show up for work tomorrow, maybe somebody should come and check on me. Well, obviously, those are not ways to receive the Holy Spirit. But as I look at the coming of the Holy Spirit, there are some things that I know absolutely to be true. And that is that each one of us already has the Holy Spirit within us. It's not that we come for something brand new. It is something that is happening already within us because Scripture says, no one can proclaim Jesus as Lord unless the Holy Spirit is already working in them. We have the Spirit. But there's a difference between having the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit. I went uh, to my daughter's, Jennifer's, over Christmas time, and I've discovered that there's a difference between attire having air in it and being filled with air. When a tire is not filled with air, the journey is much harder. And in fact, I was running on the rim for some of my journey. And so there is a thing about not just having the Spirit, but being filled with the Spirit. That's what Jesus said to his disciples, is he wants us to be filled with the Spirit. But even though we are filled with the Spirit, I would maintain there are still ways that we can frustrate the work of the Spirit. I know there are some times in Scripture where God will completely overrule and make people do things that they were not intending to do, but ordinarily, I think God wants us to participate and to let the Spirit flow. Another time with my car, I went out and put the key on, uh, turned it, and it, all you hear is that dreadful click, whirr, and I thought, oh, shoot, the battery's dead. So, took the battery out, undid it all, you know how heavy those things are, took it in, got the battery charger, put the battery charger, put it back in, tightened up all the cables, click, whirr, and I thought, oh, so, it's not the battery that's the problem started to do some searching around and found that one of the battery cables had an issue in it 
it was not the battery, it was the cable. I think similarly in our lives, we have that same problem in that we have a full battery, a battery that is already charged, but there are some ways in which we, the cables, aren't letting the Holy Spirit through. And we are able to frustrate the work of the Spirit. Well, in Scripture, in the book of the Acts, there were many different people that received the Spirit and they all fell in many different categories. And let me say, it's hard to feed people that aren't hungry. But when people are hungry, it's pretty easy to feed them. And so as I look through the Acts of the Apostles, there were those who were absolutely eager to receive the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit was prayed upon them, they received it with no trouble. There were those who were open. Not so much eager, but, well, if, if that's going to happen, it's going to happen. And they were open to the coming of the Spirit. And they too, when they were prayed for, received the Holy Spirit. There were those who were misinformed. Those who said, well, that we were baptized with the baptism of John and there's no other kind of baptism. We don't need this Holy Spirit thing. And when they were informed and became open, they too received the Holy Spirit. And there were those who were absolutely opposed to the Holy Spirit. And in the case of St. Paul, even they, even he was one that was uh, touched by God and the Holy Spirit came upon him, even though at that moment in time, he wasn't even looking for it. Well, what are some of the things that can get in the way of us being able to receive the Spirit? One is, uh, I think, uh, people often come with a sense of doubt. A sense of doubt that says, I don't know what this is all about. It's all hokey to me. I, I can't believe it, don't want it, not interested. Well, that can certainly block what God wants to be able to do. There are those who can come with a sense of fear that says, I don't want to be doing some of the things I've seen those other crazy people doing. I want to be in charge of my life and I don't want to see any of that stuff. And so thank you very much. Pass that gift over to somebody else because I'm afraid of what might happen. Uh, there are those who have a sense of personal inadequacy that says um, receiving the Holy Spirit is only for those that are uh, right, upstanding Christian folk who have been doing ministry for 30 years and are pure and holy, and those are the ones who will receive the Spirit and not me. Well, no, that, that's not what God says. Does God say once you are fixed up and whole and completely clean in all aspects, then you'll receive the Spirit? No, that's not what God says. God says it's for all people and for right now. For me personally, some of it also was being able to put aside some of my logical, rational sense of self. Uh, by nature, I'm not really an emotional person in worship. I, I don't think I ever raise my hands. Maybe, maybe once in a long while, I, I don't tend to do that. The most excited that I get in worship is sometimes I'll start to sway a little bit. And, and that's about it for me. That, that's as big as it gets. And as I look at some of the other manifestations in other people, and I say, that makes no sense to me. And God is able to speak into my mind and say, does it really have to make sense? Can it not be that there are some things that go beyond our logical, rational explanation and understanding? Can it not be that God can be God and we can just flow in what God wants to do at this moment even if we don't understand it? And there are so many things about the Spirit that I just don't understand. 
I don't understand why there seem to be epochs in time where the Spirit of God will just land at one place at one time and absolutely remarkable, miraculous things will happen. But why not at the church next door? I don't know. I don't understand that. And why is it that sometimes the Spirit will be absolutely evident for a season and sometimes that season will end and it is very hard to see the miraculous at that moment and the answer for me is I don't know all I know is that God wants to bring himself into the life of the church and that means into you and into me in a moment we're going to have a time of prayer where we just ask those who are willing and open to say come and can we pray for you can we just pray that what you already have in you now might be stirred up in a new way that you may not understand today but may one day come to understand and that it will be a gift of God that is a good gift. God does not give rotten gifts to the church. <laughs> he only gives good gifts. On this day of Pentecost, we think not only the, of the birth of the Jewish nation, but we think of the birth of the Christian nation. As the presence of God came in power, revitalized, renewed believers, and we, may we see the power of God evident in this generation as well. Amen.